Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Um, so I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the membership and events manager at the Asheville Art Museum. I'm so glad you were all able to take some time to join us for today's member program. I'm very excited to welcome John Littleton and Kate Vogel, who will be leading today's program. And before I turn this over to them, I just want to go over some housekeeping for all of our attendees. First, your microphones are muted and video is off by default. You should note that we are recording today's program. So if you don't want to be recorded, please make sure that those remain off. And you can check that by looking at the camera and microphone symbols at the bottom left of your screen. They should have red lines through them to make sure that they're off. And last, you um, have two options for asking questions or making comments. The first is to type your question or comment into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to ask questions as we go. Kate and John will be reading those. And the second option is to use the raise hand feature, which you can find by clicking on participants at the bottom of the screen. When there's time, I'll call on anyone with a raised hand, unmute you, and you can speak directly to John and Kate. And finally, if there's anything you think we can do to improve these Zoom programs, please do let us know. Um, I will send out an evaluation after today's program, uh, so you could share your feedback that way, or you can email me directly. So thank you again for being here. And now I'm going to start with a video recording of John and Kate's studio. So just give me one moment as I share that on my screen. Welcome to our studio. I'm John Littleton. Come on in. Hi, I'm Kate Vogel. John and I have been collaborating for a number of years. Come on in. We'd like to show you our studio today. So let's look around a little bit. There's a little bit of work from all sorts of series. These are some of our early pieces here on the shelves. They go back to the 1980s. Some more contemporary pieces that we've done. This is a piece about time. And as you look around the studio, you'll start seeing that there's a lot of prints on the walls. These prints are from John's father's studio. There's a few of dad's pieces as well. Some of our early bags. And here's some of our series of the Clarity Imprisoned. These are cast blocks with life castings incorporated into them. And our photo stand, some more of the prints, and you can see our hands and gem pieces. Some of the spiral series that we made. So the prints that are on the walls were made in Harvey's studio over maybe a 25 year period of time. He had a master printer in his studio that worked full time and he invited artists from all over the world. There were 700 editions run by over 100 different artists. Here's one of our hands and gem pieces. The gem element is held in realistic cast hands and that layering inside represents potential and energy for us. Come on into our gallery. We want to show you some of the new pieces we're working on. This 
this piece is blue beginning, or excuse me, the in between. I don't know if you can see this, but there's actually a space in between the upper and lower part. We've been really interested in how we can use lighting in the pieces to actually help carry your eye between the different spaces and that the lighting will carry your eye down to that space again. And these layers are reminiscent from our cut gem pieces where you have layer after layer inside. This is another new piece that we've done, Lead Planned. It has openings cut into the hemispheres so that you can catch glimpses of the spheres inside. Sometimes they line up. walk around the room, you can see some of the other pieces we've done. We've worked on a number of series. Here's one of our pieces from the Ikebana series, our Vessel for the Soul, another Ikebana. Here's a direct connection between the pieces, even if it's not always obvious. You can see one of our flower pieces here where it's actually held in the hands, like some of the earlier pieces you were looking at. They happen to be our daughter's hands. I think they're really beautiful. And here we have another Vessel for Your Soul piece. Some of our tables and side lights. cut pieces. Here's some of our, one of our rock pieces from the rock series with this inclusion in here. It's cast glass. Then we have a case full of models and some of our older work. This is also our office area here. And then our print storage, which we have quite a bit of. We have a lot of prints from Harvey's studio. And then here on the table, we have just a few pieces from our some public art proposals that we're working on. Some samples and a model. So this is our coal working area here, cutting and grinding wheels to diamond saws. You can see here's a number of pieces that we've been working on. Um, one that's how it would come when we finish blowing it. They might look like this. And then a piece like this is turned into one like this with all the surfaces cut and ground on it. So we usually have a lot of different projects going on in our studio, so you can see parts to all sorts of things. The shelves are filled with all of the spheres that we blew in January and February when the furnace was on, parts for some of the larger pieces that we're working on. We have parts for some cast pieces we're working on where we're thinking about making some things that will actually go on the seats. And then come on into our mold making room and I'll show you some of the things that we've done in here as well. This is the space that we do mold making in, modeling. It also ends up being a collection space for all the different projects we're working on. You can see here some of the spheres that have been sawn in half as we start thinking about the colors that we're gonna be using for the different layers and making a piece. There's different models. You can see some of the models that we have 
for looking at, we consider these like a sketch for looking at what a large piece might look like. Here's another one here. With some of these pieces, we've actually been thinking about them as each one of these spheres as an energy or point. Just like stars in the sky, we use our eyes to connect a constellation. And here we've used these lines in the middle to connect the different energies in the piece. Here we're laying out the basics for one of the uh, spheres and pipe pieces. You can see here that this piece, if you were sawing them in half, each color would go in one layer inside to the other. Another project we're working on, we have some waxes laid out here and we're thinking about what sort of flowers and parts might go into it. So you can see we have quite a few things going on all at once. But come on in, I'll show you where our blowing room is. Our furnace is not on right now, but it will give you a sense of what that space is, looks like. And when we're not doing um, glass blowing in here, it's also the place that we do welding and other work. So here's our hot shop. It's become a multi-purpose room. You can see our welders out because we've been doing welding lately. Here's our furnace set up with a big clear pot for blowing glass. We've had it set up with three pots inside for pouring. It's off right now, but it gives you a sense of what it looks like. And here's the glory hole, which is only on for while we're working and reheating. We have a lot of ovens in the studio. Sometimes the pieces take weeks or months to cool. So we use our ovens for both casting and blowing. And there's more metalworking equipment, the bench. All of our buckets covered with plastic right now. <laughs> and our marver that's also covered with plastic. <laughs> and that's most of the hot shop. So um, that was our studio tour and um, a lot of questions coming up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of them was questions that we just answered very briefly was what has been our inspiration for the pieces? And I think that each series, the inspiration is a little bit different, but really the core of it is the collaborative process that we use for making our work. And I think probably the best way to talk about that is for us to just jump in and tell you a little bit about some of the pieces we make. And if if you can bring up the, yep, that's perfect. Um, so the very first series of pieces that John and I worked on together, we call them soft forms. We met at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, we were taking the glass classes there. My father had been teaching there but he'd left shortly before Kate started the glass program. I'd had a few classes with him, but- um, We started collaborating actually in his studio. And these are some of the- dad's studio. Yeah, these are some of the early pieces we made. And we were really wanting them to look fabric-like and soft. Glass is really fluid when it's hot. And we wanted to capture that in a frozen, solid, cold piece. And um, the fiberglass is what you're seeing that um, has that fabric-like quality. It's painted with glass enamels. It's encased in between layers of clear glass. So the color is, uh, the background color is what we start with, a little piece of color. Uh, we'll put clear glass and get it to the right size and then add the fiberglass. Okay, do you want to go to the next one, Carolyn? Or Car oh, sorry, Kirsten. Kirsten. So here's another one um, of the um, pieces. It's just another soft form. So we were thinking about like what a handkerchief is like or like a party favor. Next. And the community allowed us to uh, get into galleries, show internationally. And uh, our work developed as we worked together, just the discussion about, oh, that one fell on the floor, but there's something really great about it. What can we do that would make that look good? Okay. So you, I know some people always ask, well, how do you make these pieces or how do they look so soft? So you can see here, John is actually putting folds into a, what was a hot cylinder 
you can see that the glass is very movable at that point. Next. And we bring the neck in with metal tools or wooden tools and centrifugal force. It's on, the, on that bench there and we're spinning it or moving it slowly against the metal tool. Yeah. This is adding the colored bit around the neck. After it's fully formed, that's when you put that little wrap around it. Yeah. Yeah. The little ones are kept in an oven and we reheat, we'll make that big one and have it on the pipe. And we reheat the little ones one at a time and place them. We'll talk about what the arrangement will be and we're placing them really hot onto each other so that they're, they're bending and forming around each other. And so you can see John has on a pair of gloves and with those gloves, it actually allows us to manipulate the surface of the glass. So we can push in, we can say, oh, I want that fold a little deeper. Let's move that over. Next. You can see here with all four of them on. Trying to get the balance just right, uh, make it look like it, it, they would have naturally come that way. Next. So the piece on the right is after we'd started putting pieces inside of each other, um, we got three bags inside of a big bag and that was about as much glass as we could handle. So we thought, well, we could make those little ones stand by themselves. And that soft surface is from etching. It uh, gives it a slight opacity. They're uh, relatively transparent before we etch them, just like that blue large bag on the left side. And we have three kids, that's our three children, Ashley and John's mom. And I think that the family also played an influence on it. We always loved the Navajo storyteller pieces where there was like a central figure with a group of um, smaller figures around it. And that really influenced us making the Imago bag. I think at the point when we started making those, our kids were pretty small and you felt like you always had somebody dragging on one of your legs when you were walking from one, one room to the other. Next. And then we had bags popping out of bags. <laughs> it was Just playing with the different forms. We, we, were, we were giving these pieces um, personalities in our minds. And so we thought, oh, what's, what else could they do? And so somebody's asking if we use a special type of glass. And the answer is yes. We started out with a formula that John's dad had developed. And then um, to fit the colors that we both melted ourselves and the ones that we bought, we altered our formula, formula a little bit. It's not real far off from the formula that Spruce Pine Batch uses, um, mm. that John's brother sells. Um, but it is a formula that's specific to what we do. It would be hard for us to um, make as much work as we do and melt all our own colors. So there's a couple of companies that make colors for glass blowers. Um, and we can use their color palette. Some colors we melt ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. And so as we continue playing with soft forms, we did a series of pieces that were dancers because we just thought it would be fun to try something else where we were just working with the glass as a really fluid, soft form. Okay. All right. And then, um, let's go to, do we have another question here? Oh. That one. Um, let's go ahead, Kristen, and let's do that. I guess we could do the cast one right away. Yeah. Is that it? Uh, I think so. Uh, yep. Just... So the, the first image is one of the cast blocks. And one of the things that we find that's always necessary is to always be experimenting and trying different things. And every time we have a new idea of something we want to make, we used, usually have to then develop the process for making it. Nowadays, it's not as much of a problem because there's more people who are making glass in their studios and we can often call up somebody and say, hey, have you ever tried this? What did you use that worked? With five of them broke in a row, what are we doing that? No didn't, one, work. <laughs> it didn't work. So with these pieces, if you can do the next slide. Oh. Next, oh, maybe it's stuck. Oh, oh, we missed one. Go back, back one. one. There, there. We go. You can see that that's a graphite mold. And so we would build graphite molds that were the shape we were going to cast. 
and we would make um, plaster sand. Um, Investment material yeah. models that were bolted into that mold. Our furnace was capable of putting, we, we had three pots in it yeah. and we could pour as much glass as we needed into that mold. The mold would be heated up in an oven and you know, so it didn't bubble and all sorts of things, technical things, but. Um, so these would be poured molten and when the piece was, that box was completely full of molten glass, we would pick it up and put it in an oven and bring it down to about 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we would pull it back out, take the graphite off of the block, and then it would be annealed. And it would be in an oven for up to three months, sometimes a little bit longer than that. So a lot of times from the beginning of the piece to the end, you'd go, what did we put away in that oven? <laughs> when it was finally cool, we would dig out all of the investment. So we called it a lost investment process. And, um, cut and polish all of the edges. Yeah. So it was quite an intensive process to yep. get it there. So next. Next slide. Yeah. yeah. Here. Um, these are the hands and gem pieces. And they were a whole different casting process. We aren't using graphite. They're life molds, again, just like the other pieces. But with these, um, we would make that cut gem part first. Next. So this part is, is hot worked and um, cut and polished, and it's made first. Then we'd look at it and say, well, my hands are too big for it, or Kate's hands are just right, or whoever's, whatever worked with the piece and the, we'd concept. look at the concept. And next slide. We'd find somebody whose hands, this is actually not that piece that we'll be casting here, but we'd find somebody's hands who fit the piece and quite often they were our kids' hands. <laughs> and then we would coach them through how we wanted the hands held, how they would be positioned in on the piece when we were doing the casting. Next. Um, this is the material that we're using to take impressions off of um, skin. It's a, a material that dentists use for taking impressions in your mouth. It's really quite safe. Next. So we would pour it into this big cavity mold. And with the hands and gems, the hands would already be in there and we'd pour around the hands. With uh, This is our son, John Paul. With these hands, we wanted them to be able to hold something so he could plunge in Without after the yeah. material was in there. Once the alginate sets up, he pulls his arms out. That takes about 15 minutes. He has to sit there while it, it gels. Yeah. And he can pull his arms out without getting a seam. The material stays is soft enough that yeah. he can pull out. Here we are filling it with wax. So these two pictures are full of um, wax that it's about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Next. And if you make solid wax molds, they'll break the next mold that you make to make the, the glass. So we have to do a, what's called slush casting. So you get about a quarter inch of wax. And once that's hardened up, but the center part's still molten, you pour out the excess wax. Next. So we dig away all of that alginate and get the hands, the wax hands out. So these are lost, the, the process is very much like a lost wax process, but each one of these is a, a one-off. So in other words, digging this wax out of the mold destroys the mold, so there won't be another one like it. Next. So then we'll work the hands to the point that we're happy with the position and all of all of it, attach it to a glass plate and start putting the investment mixes on. And it's about, what is it, like maybe? It's five layers of the first one, two or three layers of the next one, then five more layers, depending on the size of the piece. And the reason that we use all the different layering is we find that it's really important for the mold materials to have different qualities. So the first one is um, pretty hard and pretty strong and it allows us to, um, pick up all the details like down to the fingerprint on a person's hand. And then the, the layers past that are softer so they're more forgiving so that if you have a really delicate finger or something that the mold's not structurally so hard that it would break the glass. 
during the cooling process. They have different expansions, yeah. so you have to accommodate that. Yes. Here you can see this is putting on a layer that sort of smooths it out so that the mold is a, a more smooth, consistent form. The length of time it's in the oven is dependent on how thick everything ends up being. So we use a, a harder shell on the outside to, it really reduces the amount of time in the oven. Yeah, because it's structural integrity, yes. So that's the la very last layer that's painted on that mold. Next. So we've melted the wax out. We can recycle some of it. Uh, and for our glass, we burn out the mold so there's no um, organic residue that's attaching to the glass. So the molds are stacked in an oven with glass ready to fill it. And these are some colors that we melted to get that amber and darker amber. And instead of having a huge uh, reservoir on top, we fill them as we go. So that's me adding some more uh, chunks of glass. And here's the piece after it's come out of the oven and it's cooled off, we're starting to remove the layers of investment. And this is actually a different piece than what you saw earlier. It was just one that we had, um, that we were demolding. Some images of, yeah. Yeah, so you can see, you can go to the next one. So that was some vines twining around the yeah. hands. But you can see with a piece like this, demolding it could take us hours to get all of that off of there. Next. And this is diamond sawing the bottom of the arms so that we have a, a, an even base to work from. And gr grinding, and we for these pieces we don't polish them; they just get scratched. So yeah, we just finish up the bottom so it's smooth, and we'll see it be sit. I think that's it, isn't that's it? That's it on those. Yeah. So someone had a question about the blocks. Let's um, see. Where was that? It says, "Do you have any insight to share on the head pieces symbolically?" Um, we were working on the series of heads where we were working with inner and outer thoughts. Um, it was something about the, what you present to the public versus what you're feeling inside. But there were, there were other uh, ideas that went yeah. with those pieces. But they were very, I think those, that series of pieces was very reflective where you were really looking at those, those concepts inside. So I think we one had of them this is like- little, little space that you were controlling the, the view into. And it was uh, kind of a, a moment. Yeah, a personal moment. moment. So are some of them, there's like somebody pulling a mask off of their face, like revealing who is behind it. Or there might be that conversation. I think there's one that- Don't do just, that again. <laughs> yeah, the, the finger talking behind your face. Um, oh, our favorite piece is always the one that we're working on right then. <laughs> <laughs> That's, true. That's true. I mean, there are some pieces when you look back at a series that you might go, oh, that one was really, that one really hit the mark. But I definitely think you're most excited about what you're working on now. Um, so I think maybe let's go to the picture of our sons next. Um, so all three of our children grew up in our studio. Um, they were down there a lot. We had a space set up that they could work. There's our two boys. Our daughter also, she's obviously not in this photo, but um, our two sons work at SpaceX. And we think that there's an incredible connection between science and art. And our boys would say the same thing, that they learned a lot about um, making, creating, thinking about problem solving, being children of artists. And they took that very thing to SpaceX. And I think that our also sharing with our kids our excitement about the night sky. And um, <laughs> we just got to get a, a family discount to the moon. Actually, what's sort of funny is all of us really like being here on Earth. We think it's exciting going the to the moon. boys love working on that technology, but they, they have no <laughs> desire to go to space. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, next. Um, is the, um, the next video? Video, yeah. And I think, Kristen, you were going to turn down the volume as low as we could, so hopefully we can talk over it. Hopefully it will work. We'll try it. Yes. 
I'll do that. I'm just pulling it up okay. now. A few steps to get it ready. Okay. So I don't know, can people hear us over it? Is that working? Okay. So with these pieces um, that we've been working on, we've been incorporating motion, sound, and have been really excited by the way it both engages us and the viewer and that connection to science and that sort of wonder and awe of when you see something that um, you can connect to but you're kind of like trying to figure out what's going on what's happening what am i seeing our younger son said these are like a study in chaos motion um they're they're gimbals but they're off balance so that the motion's unpredictable they'll change direction the things that we've really been playing with is how can we use light motion and sound to engage our audience and also to engage us and have us look at both the glass and what we're looking at in a different way um, these pieces have been really exciting to us um, they incorporate some of the very elements that we were using in both some of the cast blocks that we did and with the hands where you're looking at something that shows um, potential energy it could you know allude to um, astronomical planets um, and it's just been real exciting for us to play with that and one of our dreams right now is that we will be able to take this one step further and actually work with um, some people who have much more computer background than we do where we can take a large piece like the in-between that you saw in our studio and take something where you would work with elements that covered an entire ceiling in a space and that as the viewer was there that the piece would possibly interact with movement from people in the room or connect with movement to like a composed piece of music such as the piece you just heard that was connected with these pieces um, and also using the lights so that they would carry your eyes around the room. But um, I think that's kind of a project <laughs> down the line a little bit. But um, I think what we find as we collaborate th on things that every time you finish a piece and you're looking at it, the two of us will look at each other and go, oh, what do you think would happen if we tried this? And so the very first of these pieces that had the spheres in them, it was a really large piece that was commissioned for an office building that was hung on the ceiling and it had no lights in it. And when we finished it, we said, oh my gosh, if it had lights in it, you would see the piece differently. And then we did the in-between with the lights and people looked at it and said, does something move? And we're like, no, it doesn't move. And we're like, oh, we have to try some pieces that move. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's part of what's fun is that dreaming of what comes next and um, how pieces interact and um, connect with each other. Um, and then, oh, I know what we should do is we should also do a screen share on something here. We're, I think, Kristen, we're gonna try and screen share from our, yep, here it is. So we just got, um, did it work? Um, I'm trying to find it. Yeah, if you do share screen at the bottom, and then you'll have to choose the image you're trying to share. Okay, so you need to go full size there. We're trying, here it is, there, there it is. is. Okay, all right, it's right there. Okay, try it. Let's see if it works. Okay, so um, we're really excited because we just signed a contract for this public art piece. This is just um, Photoshopped into this spot right now? It's on Lake Michigan, uh, near Muskegon, Michigan. And it's gonna be in a traffic roundabout. So the lake will be the backdrop and this piece will be 22 and a half feet high by 38 feet wide. It will be stainless steel and glass. And the um, rings actually will have, there's dusk to dawn lighting system in it. And so at night, once it becomes dark, those rings will start lighting up in a pattern. 
um, as someone approaches the piece. Um, it will be the largest public art piece we've ever completed. And uh, we're both kind of nervous about it, but also very, very excited because it's an incredible opportunity and such a beautiful setting to um, create a piece for. Uh, so that's probably, that's our most recent um, <laughs> thing happening in it, in, with it. Um, and I don't know if people have other questions as a result, you know, of the conversations as we've been kind of like walking through um, all of this. Do you want or, me to still show yeah, the in-between video? Oh yeah, that would be good. That's fun. Great. Yeah. Can you pull that up really quickly? Uh, what year will it be unveiled? We're hoping that we'll be able to have the piece installed by next spring. Um, weather, they would like it by the end of December, but, but we're, we're not sure about the weather. We're, well, or also about the coronavirus issues about being able to travel someplace with that kind of distance. Um, but it, it's going to happen really fast. <laughs> okay. So this was in our gallery tour, and it doesn't have any sound with the video, so we can talk over it. Yeah. But you can see here how the lights are lighting up in a pattern and it moves from the top to the bottom. So what's exciting for us is you can control it. At this point, the programming is pretty primitive because we were just starting to learn about what the potential is. But the more we dig into this, the more we've been learning about how much change you can make with it. Um, we have some change in intensity here. It's hard to see in this video. If you were actually sitting in the room with it, you'd notice it more. And it's running a 30 second sequence. Oh, oh it's trying to do the next video. <laughs> <laughs> so we name a lot of our pieces, but not all of them. Um, yeah. Usually this series will have a name. And if there are pieces that take us four or five months to make, we usually give it its, it's, it's name. Have own name, yeah. So the in-between was really about that space between what's above and below. And I think, did we get, is there anybody whose questions we didn't answer because they were coming so fast at some point? I think there was one question um, back when you were showing the uh, piece that moved, who was, they were asking if there's a motor or if it's kinetic energy. It's kinetic energy. It'll it'll run depending on how balanced it is for, oh, don't you think it runs about 45 seconds or a minute? You just give it a gentle push with your hand. Mm -hmm. So let me see. How much does how much does it cost to make the piece with glass? I wonder which piece are they, are they talking about the public art piece, or I'm not sure which one they're talking about? It's a, it's a different expense depending on what you're making. So someone who's running their furnace all the time, they'll have um, fixed costs of over $1,000 a month just to run their furnace and electricity. We have gone more to uh, casting. So uh, we can take our time and work on the waxes or parts of the piece for a couple of months and it's really our time that's yeah well i mean the materials are expensive but it's it's more that we have time invested in it than the actual materials and the other thing is because most of our pieces are pretty time intensive we don't make tons of them every year we're not we're not a production studio we're making one of a kind pieces so it really is our investment of time and so how do we know the range of temperatures will be okay for this piece outside we have a friend in Michigan who does large scale glass and, and steel sculptures. And we consulted with him before we did a proposal for another location that we didn't get about what would work. And we have a piece outside in South Carolina. That's been that's, there for a couple of years now and it's fine. But also we did quite a bit of consulting. So the rule is, if you think about window glass, all of our houses have windows glass. Window glass has been in homes where the inside temperature can be anywhere from 40 degrees to 90 degrees and the outside temperature could be anywhere from 40 below to 100 degrees and that doesn't break. But it's because of the thickness of the glass that you're using, the way it's, it's created, 
Um, obviously, some of our glass now for safety reasons is tempered. So the pieces that are cast, if you were to, to look at that, none of the blocks are really large. They're really small components and they're only an inch thick. And they're joined with a structural silicone so that the difference in expansion between the materials is um, Mitigated. forgiven yeah. by the, the silicone junctions. Spacing. But we did quite a bit of research on it and have consulted with quite a few people. And in those thicknesses, it's perfectly fine outside. Um, obviously, you have to use a durable glass and it has to be annealed properly to begin with. But if you follow those general rules, and the other thing is, is we also design it so there's no place where water is going to collect. We're not going to make like a bowl that you could collect water in and then the water could freeze inside that and then the expansion of the water would break the glass. All of these pieces have flat surfaces that can't collect water. So the large um, public installation piece will be in Muskegon, Michigan. It's a, they just finished the roundabout, so we were just getting the images of it. And our piece in South Carolina is at Spartanburg Waters main offices. It's yeah. a public-private um, utility. Okay, are world events having an influence on the type of work you are doing now? Wow. Uh, they're making it harder to get our work done. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that uh, it's as artists, I don't know how it couldn't have an effect on you. Um, it certainly has been a part of our conversation. Um, and it's, a, it's also, it's a big concern for us as artists, what, what is our, both our responsibility and, you know, there's days when I think, gosh, you know, our art is really insignificant to what everybody else is dealing with in the world. But at the same time, I also feel like it's really important for there be a place of beauty and calm and peace, a place that we can all go and sort of refill and regenerate when we've been depleted by everything that's happening. Um, but I think to say that it's not affecting us would you? I don't know how. But we could don't. Work. We don't usually make literal pieces about uh, current events. We're more working with our inner our inner feelings and our dialogue between ourselves, but certainly it will influence who we are. Um, or at least I would hope it would on some level that it would make us better people in the end is that we will all step back and think about things. Um, where's the public? Okay, you said that. Um, I'm trying to look at the other questions if I missed something. Um, how do you know? Okay, the range of temperatures. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> we would love it if you all came to um, Muskegon when they finish the piece and it's unveiled. You could do a trip up there. We'd meet you. <laughs> um, Kathy just sent a question. Uh, did you make the arms on your eyeglasses frames? <laughs> Please? No. <laughs> I wish. Oh, <laughs> uh, yep. Great. There you um, go. Um, I think everyone is really enjoying hearing about your artistic process, and um, you touched on it briefly in uh, the studio tour, um, those kind of floral arrangements that you're doing, the Ikebana, I think. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how nature also influences you. Yeah, um, we have about 40 acres that we live on. We've lived here, we've collaborated for 40 over years. For 40 years. <laughs> and, um, we, we walk around the property every day if we can. And uh, it's just been such a great place to live. It's, it shows up in, in some of our pieces. We take uh, models from, we did a, a, a table with all of the different types of oak that we could find on our property. Or, or ferns, we've done things with ferns in them. So the, the nature, and I think that also comes back to that science and that sense of wonder and awe. So oftentimes when we're out walking in the woods, we'll see something and we go, oh my God, look at that, that's amazing. And you think you've seen, you know, you live someplace for 40 years and you walk the same trail every day, you would think you had seen everything and there'd be nothing to surprise you. But we might find another orchid that we hadn't seen before or the ghost pipes are up right now. Or strange mushrooms or just like a bizarre insect or some bird you've never seen. And so I think part of, I, I, part of our work is that 
being sort of surprised in that wonder and awe, which is the same thing about looking at that night sky, is that looking up there and there's, even as much as we know and we experience every day, I hope there will never come a day when I'm not just like awestruck by something or just like overwhelmed by the beauty of something simple, whether it's a blade of grass or the way the breeze is moving something around me or the way it makes me feel. And I think that that plays into our work. When we go into the studio, we're talking about how do you capture the way that feels or when you look at that, does it feel that way that when you look at a beautiful um, flower? So the Ikebana flower arrangements, the Japanese have a very, very formal, most of them, there are some informal Ikebana, but most Ikebana arrangements, it's a very formal process and it's years of schooling that teaches you how to make a certain arrangement so they will be balanced and um, there's, I don't know if I'd really want to call them formulas, but certain ways of arranging things. We're not that sort of formal, but we're, we're inspired by it. Yeah, you look at that and you think about how that has that beautiful quality to it. Or when you look at that arrangement, how um, there's just a sense of calm there. And so there's been some of the pieces that we've done that. Some of the new boat pieces, the vessel for my soul pieces, we were very much looking for that place of calm, that place where you feel held and safe and um, protected. So a couple of questions. Um, the effect of a sunset on our uh, large commission that's coming up, your view of, will be to the west and the glass in it is um, the colors of the, the water and the sky and the plants in the area. So having that color change and the, the light coming through the glass and silhouetting the stainless steel that it'll be made of is, is going to be spectacular. I We're think. pretty um, excited. And the other thing is, is having a piece like this outside, we played with, we did a full scale model in glass and steel, well not full scale, a, a one inch model in glass and stainless steel. And when you would shoot really bright lights through it at angles, it actually will throw shadows on the ground from the glass that are gonna be greens and blues and the colors of those rings. So um, we're really excited to see because you can conceive of something in your mind, but then to bring it into reality and see it in three dimensions and be able to walk around it, it's it's always a very different experience. And I know that when we complete this piece that we will see things that we didn't know were gonna be there and that they will be a jumping point for what we might do next in the future and will definitely affect our, our future work. Um, that's been, I think that's pretty much been the case for everything we've ever made, mm -hmm. um, that, that one piece will um, influence the next. And to what extent do you work for fun, your own pleasure, and to what extent for commissions? Well, hopefully they're the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the time our work is fun, although we've hit technical snags where it takes us a year to figure something out. And, um, we had one assistant say, I just can't, I can't do this. You have to do that part. Because it would fail every time she would demold the piece, it would be broken. And she goes, I can't demold these anymore. I'm like, going, it's okay. And she goes, that's easy for you to say. I said, no, it's not easy for me to say. I just know that we have to go through a certain number of failures to get to a point of success. And I can't, I can't get hung up on the failure. I have to look at it and say, if it didn't work, what can I learn from this? And we know that once we get it, we can usually reproduce it. Not, not always, but most of the time we can, we'll get a very high success rate once we know how to do it. Yeah. Sounds like that's a good philosophy for life too. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So if you're asking about extent for commissions, um, I, we have had very few commissions. I mean, I can't actually, when I think about it, I can't think of any commission that, I was ever sorry we did or that I didn't like. There's been moments during a commission where at times it's been frustrating if um, we haven't had good communications with a client. And usually it's not if we're dealing with the client directly, but if, it's, if there's too many layers between us and the person we're doing the commission with. Um, it's really interesting to find out what people see 
when they look at your work and what they what their expectations are and mm -hmm. so that's a, a wonderful part of the process mm -hmm. And a commission can also be very collaborative for us, which can be really, it can be frustrating at times, but it also can be a huge learning process because it can push you in a direction that you might not take on your own and make you stretch. If we think a commission is too far out of the scope of what our concept or ideas are, we just will tell the client up front, we'll just say, you know, I hear what you're saying and it's a really cool idea, but we're probably not the person to do this for you because we know that we won't be able to produce something that they'll be happy with. But if it's a commission we agree on doing, we've actually had a lot of fun with them. And yeah. it's also great because we also then um, create a deeper relationship with that person we're making the piece for because there's a lot of give and take that goes into creating a special piece for someone. Does anyone have any last questions for Kate and John? It's been really great hearing from you this afternoon. I think this was a perfect way to spend a lunch break. I hope all the members agree as well. Um, I'll just give everyone a couple more seconds. Uh, but if there are questions that occur to you after we have ended, you can feel free to send those to me. I'd be happy to pass them on to Kate and John, or I did share their website earlier, and I'd be happy to share that again in the follow-up email that I'm going to send. Uh, I'm sure that their contact information is also on their website. Um, what artwork is in the museum? Ah. I guess, which of your pieces are in our collection. And I can say that we do have one of the bag pieces in the collection, which is one of my favorites, as they were saying, it just looks so soft and flexible and um, it's, it's kind of amazing to know that that's made of glass. It, it looks satin-like in a way. So, um, so great. So everyone, it sounds like they're ready to wrap up. So thank you so much, Kate and John. This was wonderful. Um, I will share your YouTube page and your website in the follow-up email so people can keep up with you and know what's going on. And uh, if they're showing at Momentum, I encourage all of you to go and check that out. Is Momentum open at the moment? I don't think they're open. Well, I was they thinking they'd be. be opening this week. I know they were going to be opening by appointment only, I think is what it was, but I don't know that they have like public public hours yet thank you everybody for coming and yeah watching. yeah thank you all and thank you to our members i hope you all um, can continue to join us for these member programs we're going to keep doing them weekly until we reopen and i know a lot of you have also been asking us to keep them going after we reopen and we are working on doing that for you probably just at a reduced rate so we can keep you coming back into the building as well when it's safe to do so. So I'll send out the evaluation a little bit. Um, I hope to see many of you again next week. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.